My name is Tomasz Koval. I'm working with Erlang for the last five years. I recently moved to Elixir at Club Collect. By the way, both Erlang Solutions and Club Collect are, are hiring. And also, I'm uh, programming uh, in Elm in my free time. And the one thing I want to tell you before I start is that I hate programming language comparisons. I, I truly hate it, like from the top of my heart, because usually they are really one-sided. It's like, this language A has a nice feature and B doesn't, therefore A is better. And if programmers of language B don't see it, they're suffering from the blob paradox. The blob paradox was introduced by Paul Graham in his great essay, Beating the Averages. And what he also introduces in the same essay is that programming languages can be put in a power continuum, like from zero to over 9,000. And the, the problem with it is that programming languages are tools. So for me, it's like comparing hammers and screwdrivers. I mean, a hammer can be used by a construction worker to everything, including screws, and the watchmaker will say that hammer is a useless tool. So it's maybe not smart to disagree with Paul Graham during public speech, but I did it anyway. So I want to define my problem really well, and my problem is building interactive websites, and I split it into two sub-problems which is the front-end that should be reactive and the back-end that should be always online. And now I can give another quote by Paul Graham from the same essay, that all other things being equal, it's a mistake to program in anything but the most powerful programming language. And according to what I said, I would change it slightly that all other things being equal, it's a mistake to program in anything but the most suitable language for the problem domain. And by the way, it fits perfectly as a tweet with hashtag lambda days, just saying. <laughs> so we need an objective measure to compare two things, and I will be comparing Elm and Elixir. So what I want to use is the number of things you need to keep in mind to understand given code fragment, or programmer's memory consumption, or PMC for short. Just bear with me with this definition. I will use it a couple of times. So here is a fragment of uh, a code in uh, functional programming. Let's assume it's a pure function and that the last statement is actually the returned value. So to understand what this function will return, we need to only know the arguments that are passed in there. Those two functions that are actually, functions are great for encapsulating what should be done because seeing only the name of the function we could infer what it will return given the arguments. So there are only four things you need to know to, to infer what will be the return type. So for example, even though I'm using the same, the same syntax, let's assume that we have now a method in a class in object-oriented language. So in this case, there are more things because we also have arguments, we have the functions, but we also have properties. And the problem with properties, unlike with the functions, is that it's not enough to have its name. We probably would want to know what else can modify the property, who else, who else can set it. That's why, actually, to reason about given code fragment in OO language, we need to know entire class definition. And that's why, during studying, they always tell us to keep the functions short and keep the classes short in object-oriented language. So where am I going with this? Why am I telling you this? Because I'm going to building front-ends. And building a front-end is actually modifying document object model by reacting to events, events from user and server. So currently, the most popular programming language for that is JavaScript. And still, to this day, the most popular library is called jQuery. And how is it done in jQuery? So we're attaching some code to an event. On document being ready, do something. Next, in this do something block, we search for something in document object model. Then we attach another event on click this, uh, this thing. Do something with this thing. So the problem with this approach is that as with the OO language, there are a couple of things that are outside, mainly the DOM. So when we are using this approach, 
we have to know everything about entire document object model because we search it. And as uh, in the OO example, we need to know every piece of code that modifies the DOM, which is potentially everything in our program. So this programming model, this programming model for frontends is, is a complete nightmare. And if someone says that he doesn't like JavaScript, it's usually not because he doesn't like JavaScript per se. It's a cool language, actually, and you can do much with it if you're disciplined. And the discipline is the keyword here, because John Carmack once said that everything that is syntactically legal that the compiler will accept will eventually wind up in your code base. So we, we can't actually do big stuff using something that doesn't enforce good practices. I want a programming language or a framework that will give me those constraints. So let's enter Elm. Elm is a functional, statically typed language that compiles to JavaScript. And uh, usually you compose pure functions. However, pure functions on their own can't do anything. They can't print to screen, they can't modify the DOM, they're simply useless. That's why Elm introduces something called signals. Signals are by definition values changing over time. So your main function in Elm is a signal, is a, has a type signal of HTML. And here we can see there are different HTML, uh, the HTML is changing over time. So that means that it solves the problem of, modificating, of modifying the DOM and now if we have something in the DOM, it can create an action, an event. So all user inputs and all server events are also modeled as a signal. There's a signal of user inputs and server events. And now we can define a function that takes an initial model, takes an action, and produces new model. And this function, this update function, can be pure because the, there is the signal of actions and there's the signal of models. This is the impure part. However, the code that developer is writing is pure. And again, we can take the model and create a pure function, the view function, that creates HTML from the model. So this approach is really easy to test and it's, of course, much more easy to reason about than uh, in JavaScript. However, the problem is that there, there are two things. The problem is that uh, we generate the HTML every time, but this is solved by the virtual DOM. So this is similar to uh, React.js, and actually the implementation predates the one from React.js. And second thing is that we need to keep entire application state in model. And this is actually a cool idea, and it's great, and it's easy to use. However, we have to keep that in mind, that we need to have this state in one place. So because we have uh, only 20 minutes, let's quickly jump to another topic, which is backend programming. So if I want to create a service that is really highly available, I have to put it on some hardware, and this hardware may fail, so I want to have more computers, and I want to have network between them, and the network itself can fail, which leads to net splits, so this is not uh, really easy. In Elixir, this is solved by uh, another model, which is uh, a little bit similar to, to Elm, but a little bit more complex too. So again, we have the timeline, and we are sending messages to actors. However, in Elm, the messages from signals are processed one by one, always in order. In distributed system, the messages can be out of order. So it is the actor that says, okay, now I'm processing it, or no, just queue it for later. Then uh, here, actor gets another message, it processes it, sends it to some other actor, the other actor can die. In Elm, the graph of dependencies is static. In uh, Elixir, actually, things can change dynamically, so the actors can die, and in case you're sending something to the actor that is dead, the message gets completely discarded. So this is much more complicated. It's not as easy as in Elm. However, what this gives you are primitives for handling failure in distributed system because we can check if the actor is alive or reachable. We can subscribe to notifications about its death and 
We can also kill it from outside if we see that it is misbehaving or entered a while true loop or something like that. We can even restart groups of actors in case there's someone somehow depending on each other. So let's now check the PMC. Do you still remember the definition? So let's check the PMC for Elixir. There are also arguments. There will be functions that I omitted just for clarity, but there will also be those messages. And this is much easier than in OO because we don't have to set up the state. We just put the message there and we can, we can, we can check how this code behaves. However, in case we have a system where some process sends to this actor a message that is malicious somehow, we don't know who it was, so we potentially have to search our entire code base for the, the malicious process that is sending something wrong. So it's a little bit harder. So in terms of PMC, in terms of things that you need to keep in mind while programming, Elm is strictly better than Elixir. However, does it mean that it is a better language? Not exactly. Do you remember Cap Theorem? It basically says that you can't have th all three things at the same time, which are consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So if you're doing the available backend, you, you want the availability. You also want the availability in case of partition tolerance. So you have to give up consistency. You just can't have this nice static graph of dependencies. That's why the programming model is a little bit more involved. However, it gives you the tools to reason about programs that are, uh, that are in distributed environment. But is it is all lost? Actually, actually not. The, if you're programming a website, you don't have to know everything about those distributed systems. You don't have to know about supervision trees and spawning processes. This is a solved problem. For example, Phoenix uses uh, an Erlang uh, web server, which is called Cowboy, and it sets all the processing for you. Uh, in the same way, if you have persistent connections to database, it's also solved in your basic code. But if you need to access some external services, you have all this power under your fingers when you're programming with Elixir and Phoenix. But actually, Phoenix is not that much different than Elm. In Elm, there was this one static uh, processing pipeline. And in Elixir, in Phoenix, if you zoom in to one request, there's a concept of connection. And connection is a data structure that holds everything you need to know about the request, which is where it came from, uh, what were the parameters, but also the things that are needed to respond. So the response code, the, the actual HTML, and this is processed in a pipeline. You get the data structure called connection. It goes through an endpoint, router, pipelines, and controller. And each of these uh, think, things can be uh, a function that takes the connection and returns slightly modified connection. So if you zoom in, for example, to a controller, you can see that the controller also takes connection, returns connection. It runs it through common services, through action, and it <laughs> always returns connection. So there are similarities between Elixir and Elm. Both of them use single data structure, the, the source of truth in Elixir in Phoenix. This is uh, on, the, on the request. And the flow is always in one direction, which makes it easy to reason about and easy to debug. There is also one more special thing. They're both based on messaging, which means that uh, today Jose talked uh, about channels. <laughs> so you can basically translate what comes out of channels into Elm signals and then build a reactive application that is really easy to maintain. So this is basically all I wanted to say, and there are just three things to remember. If, if you leave this talk and remember only three things, it would be firstly that different programming languages solve different problems, Da. So if someone says that the programming language A is better than programming language B, then ask them to build what 
exactly. Second thing is that if you need to create an application that needs to be scalable and interactive, you should check out both Elixir and Phoenix and Elm. And the third thing is that if you like this talk, follow me on Twitter. Thank you very much. So by default, Phoenix uh, uses Postgres. Ah, can I repeat. Uh, the question was, uh, uh, what's the easiest way to run Elixir and Elm with some persistence? And the answer is that Phoenix by default <laughs> uses PostgreSQL. And this is the easiest way to set it up. Even on multiple nodes, you can have the database separated from your system because usually the heavy thing is the processing and even having the database in, in one place for websites is not a problem. And if you have this problem, Phoenix has this wrapper around persistence, it's called Ecto. And Ecto can work with different databases. So the question is if there is uh, a standard of sending messages between the languages. <laughs> and uh, yes, there is. Jose talked about channels. Channels are actually a standard. It's not only a Phoenix way. They build also a JavaScript library that uh, can handle uh, using channels from the browser. But you could also build the solution <laughs> that runs on mobile or, or somewhere else. So just translating the messages from uh, channels from Phoenix side to JavaScript is, is already solved. What you would do to have them in Elm is just write a tiny wrapper in Elm. Everything that connects to, to JavaScript, which is impure and is not Elm, is wrapped in something called port. Thank you very much.